if you have a battle buddy that is going through something and you don't know what they're going through, just be there for them. But if you have a battle buddy and you know they've been sexually assaulted, it's an uncomfortable conversation, but sometimes maybe the best thing you can do is just say, hey, I'm here for you. I don't know what to say to you, but I'm here for you. Hey team, check it out. Today we talked to Major Haley Pisciano. Major Pisciano has spent her career advocating for the rights of sexual assault victims. A survivor of sexual assault and abuse, Major Pisciano shares her personal story and a perspective on recovery and the growth of the Army SHARP program. Holly, Major Pisciano, thanks for sitting down and having a conversation with us today. Thanks so much, sir, for having me here. It's, it's really an honor to uh, be able to share with you my thoughts about sexual assault and surviving sexual assault, especially this month. Absolutely. I, I think before we talk about this in incredibly important topic, I wanted to say, number one, thank you for your service. And if you could just share with the team, as I was looking through your bio, you have an incredibly impressive you know, family that has truly demonstrated the example you know, of service to the nation. And if you could share their experiences. Sure. So, um, you know, I joined the Army. Well, I guess maybe I'll start a little bit earlier than that. Um, my mom decided to join the Army when I was four, right? So I have pretty much for my entire life been, you know, around the military service. Um, I joined while my mom was still in and my sister joined while my mom was still in. So my mom served 23 years. Um, I'm just hitting right now my 20th year, you know, in six months, I'm getting ready to retire. My final out is next week, Friday. I'm super excited about the next chapter. Um, my sister is currently, uh, she spent nine years in the Marine Corps. She decided she wanted to get out and do, you know, take care of Marines, actually. Uh, she went to medical school, um, was excited to try to get picked up by the Navy. And she instead is, you know, wearing the same uniform we are. She's currently serving out at Tripler. And my brother is a weather forecaster. He's currently a tech sergeant stationed up in Elmendorf, um, Alaska. So my entire family is serving, uh, to include my dad. Um, you know, my dad tried to join when he was way younger, but he was the only son. He was one of eight children, uh, only son available to uh, join the military service. So he was declined, but that doesn't mean his service was any less. He has been, you know, an amazing um, army husband. He's been an awesome army dad. And, and most recently, he's an awesome army grandpa. So he's been through this with us the whole time. So yeah, my whole family. That, that's impressive when you talk about duty in selfless service, an, an example of when I ask a lot of, a lot of times, I'll ask individuals if they're trailblazers or their legacy. And you can truly tell from your family, you know, the, the dedication to serve and, and be part of this less than 1% that protects the 99. So um, I, I, I thought it was important to highlight that, you know, for anybody that has showed over multiple generations. For If you come into contact with somebody that's thinking about joining the military, you know, what would you offer to them and, and share about, you know, the positive experiences that only the military can provide regardless of service? Well, I think that's super, you know, that's a great question because um, my, I left my grandpa out just because he's not immediate, but my grandpa actually served the Navy as well. Um, I think it's really important to feel like a family. You know, the, the military family is one of those very few places in the whole entire world where no matter where you are, you see somebody in uniform and you've got a friend or, you know, your neighbor or whatnot, you just immediately become a bonded pal, no matter where you are. And, and very few places can say that, you know, the military is one of those places. Yeah, I think that's, that's true. You know, when my, you know, I have a son who's uh, now 17, but as we were growing up and, and he was younger, used to think as I was serving earlier in, 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 the, in the Ranger Regiment, he thought that everybody he ran into that was wearing this uniform was a Ranger. So he grew up thinking everybody that he, went, that he ran into was a Ranger. And, and really, as he got older, he, he recognized, he replaced that word Ranger with hero. And, you know, really this dedication to serve. And so, you know, today he sees that stuff and he's incredibly appreciative of what the military has offered. You know, I, I come from a military family. I'm the oldest of five you know, three boys, two girls, the three boys were all serving, but my dad was the oldest or the second oldest of four. He all, they all, all four brothers served as well, as well as my grandfather. So service is also very important, you know, in my family as well. And, and I awful, I often share with people, you know, the experiences, the places you go, and, and they're very unique to a military family. And just as you mentioned, when you meet somebody that has 
you know, very similar experiences of whether where you've been stationed or, you know, the process of, you know, finding out that you're going to move to a different place. And the Army always finds a way. If you're stationed in Fort Drum, New York, they're going to make sure they assign you to JBLM Washington, you know, or to Korea and then move you to Germany. So they make sure you get the, you know, the full exposure of everything that's available to you. Yeah, I agree. I, absolutely. And I'll even be friends with people, you know, in the Air Force. My brother has opened that door for me. <laughs> <laughs> that's 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 true. So the uh, well, congratulations that, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, 20 years. That, that's that's an awesome accomplishment, you know, for for just the the journey and, and what, what you and your family and all the support that's going with it. And I saw that you were you had a couple different endeavors that you're looking at doing specifically, you know, uh, this organization as a collaborative member of Difference Makers, you know, kind of 10 strong. I was wondering if you could highlight what that was and, and, and what you're doing kind of next as you transition. Well, um, you know, Difference Makers 10 Strong started as a group of just really 10 people that were trying to make a difference. And the collaborative partners piece of this ended up coming about um, last year where it, it isn't just 10 people, you know, and Eric Barrias is one of, he's the founder of Difference Makers 10 Strong. And, and he just really decided to kind of let people collaborate in because every single one of us has a different kind of ex expertise to bring to the table. You know, we, um, some of us have survived, in my case, military sexual trauma. There are some people that have, you know, survived, um, uh, traffic, human, tra human trafficking. There are some folks that have survived incest and we're all a team of people who really want to work together to get the word out about, you know, surviving this, you know, it's, it's really tough when, um, when you have people who don't understand trauma and they, they don't understand what you need to hear from other folks about, you know, survival. I think that in my case, surviving military sexual trauma is, it's not, simple. You know, it's a, it's a career long kind of situation. As you just shared, you know, we never go from one duty station to another and don't accidentally bump into somebody that we saw from, you know, our previous duty station or whatnot. And I think that, you know, Difference Makers 10 Strong has given so many different people voices about um, being able to share their story and share with people that the journey is tough, but it's totally doable. You know, one of the things that we we talked about during our last meeting was how the recovery process isn't linear. It's very circular, right? Um, and just using myself as an example, you don't recover from A to B. You recover sometimes by learning the same, you know, lesson a couple of different times, or you go you go forward, but sometimes you go back. And um, you know, I was just sharing earlier today about resilience and how resilience isn't a thing you do, but it's really a, a skill you learn. Um, you know, 20 years ago, I needed a different kind of resilience. When I joined the army, I thought resilience was like <laughs> finishing a PT test, <laughs> right? Versus today, resilience is figuring out how to navigate, you know, two teenage daughters who are struggling with some emotional stuff. So I I think that um, Difference Makers 10 Strong has really given a, a voice to people in, in so many different um, aspects of, uh, of abuse. It's not about sexual trauma or domestic violence, but it's just really about abuse in general. So I'm really honored to be one of their collaborative partners. Um, so I will be doing, you know, I will be working with the Difference Makers 10 Strong, but I actually am doing something super Outside of the box, uh, I start culinary school in two weeks. Oh, wow. That's so right. I'm going to do something that, you know, most people don't do. <laughs> I'm jumping all in. I'm not really sure how I'm going to do. I don't like to cook fish, and I've got a whole season of seafood. <laughs> um, so we'll see how that works. <laughs> That's great. The uh, Difference Makers 10 Strong sounds like an incredible platform group of individuals that are really finding ways to, to bring those and, and provide an, an outlet, a model, and some resources for those to share their story, you know, inspire, as you mentioned, you know, and, and a lot of times we share the same things, you know, we, we talked about and we've had several guests that have talked about talent and skill, but, you know, you make a, you make a great point, you know, 
there's a point where you continue to have to develop this competency and skill. And it's not necessarily for you, but it's what, what you have to do to either lead in this organization or what you need to do for as a parent, you know, for those that are now leading, you know, kids. There's a lot of things that, you know, my son is has experienced that I didn't experience or, wear, or worry or care about, you know, when I was when I was his age. And, there, and there's a lot of things that I tell people all the time, you know, I grew up in, in my frame of reference and in, in my paradigms were, were, limited, were limited based on what my parents had provided to me. You know, so if you were mean to somebody, you know, that a puppy would die. And so the moment that they ended up, you know, in, inventing Google and I could I would tell my son all the same things that my parents had, had offered to me to kind of keep me on the path. And he started, you know, fact checking me. Then I realized that I needed to provide the why and also examples, and then find multiple approaches. And I had to study multiple approaches or then take him to, to different individuals that were, you know, experts in getting the resources to allow him to continue to grow. And, and I think most importantly is, is I, I was really impressed as you were talking about this inclusivity of, of bringing everybody together. It's just not very narrow, you know, when you're talking about, you know, a specific type of trauma, but everybody has got an opportunity to share their story and how they overcome with this. But, you know, it's, it's the same thing that we want as parents. It's the same thing we want as leaders. And so hopefully the same thing that, that you're doing the great work with this, this incredible organization, you know, we can glean lessons from as we continue to watch that we can share and bring in our own personal and professional lives. No, I completely, absolutely agree. Yeah, absolutely. So, so you know, as we mentioned, you know, for, for coming toward the tail end of April, and, and, and we talk about it here in the military, you know, there's been this big focus with re-messaging what people first really means. And, and, and our boss talks about it in two different ways. You know, it's building this predictability and how do you build trust? And when we talk about trust, you know, we in the military have this responsibility, a fiduciary responsibility to build trust with the American public and build trust within our own organization. The biggest things that, that deteriorate this is what we're now focusing on, and we have very specific days where we bring our forces together, and primarily in small groups, and we talk about unhealthy behaviors, you know, suicide, sexual assault and harassment, extremism, racism, domestic violence. So with this month and what it means and the focus the military has, I was wondering if, if you could share, you know, when somebody says, hey, this is April, and this is, you know, a, an emphasis on awareness of sexual assault and sexual harassment. What does that mean for you, Holly? Well, um, you know, most people that know me know that I, I am pushing all year long, but I'm so excited for April because that really is when we, you know, get to kind of um, focus on teaching people, giving them the skills and really be able to um, highlight things they can pick up on, right? I think it's, it's tough because there's so many different things that we have to deal with as, a, as an organization, army-wide, military-wide, whatnot, that really, um, it makes it hard. You can't focus on everything every day, right? So April is when we focus on kind of recognizing and, and giving people the skills that they need to, to learn and, and recover from this. I think for me, Sexual Assault Awareness Month is really, um, it's a busy month because that's really when not only do we get to brief, but at every single brief, you know, that I have given, um, there's always someone in the audience that reaches back out to me and says, thank you, because of you, I'm going to get help. And I think that that's really, really important, right? We, we're not only teaching our leaders kind of what to expect and how to, you know, recognize, but we're, we're letting people know that it's okay. Um, you know, I was, I was actually talking this morning um, to the NETCOM team about trust, and I think it's really important to highlight just some of the changes that we've made as, a, as an army. Um, you know, I am the only person in the army right now that, is, that has been able to say that I've been through the court martial process twice with the same abuser. So I went through the court martial process twice in 2006, um, which is really before right? The military said, this behavior is not acceptable. Um, but my abuser ended up going through a second court martial in 2014. So I'm the only person in the army that can, that can really speak from experience about what changes we've made and, and how has trust become and, and come a long way. And I think that for me, um, I didn't have trust in my first commander, right? When I came forward back in 2006, 
um, my abuser was very good at what he did. Um, and I think that when you have an abusive person that is really kind of able to pull the wool over people's eyes, right? Because we look at somebody and we say, oh my gosh, that person is trustworthy. They get the job done. They are decorated. You know, they get a 300 on their PT test. Like all of these things that we kind of used to put in this bubble that say that is a good soldier. Um, and then, you know, I didn't get a 300 on my PT test. And while I was great at the range and did my job and whatnot, I didn't have the same rapport with my command team as he did because of just really where we worked and whatnot. But um, he had a different level of trust with them. So when he, um, he and I ended up having kind of a physical altercation and he ended up sending me to the hospital. And during that altercation and during that hospital stay, he kind of attacked me again. And he was court-martialed for that attack. And after we got out of, after I got out of the hospital and during his, his first court-martial, my command team went and spoke on his behalf. And really that devastated me, right? Because I was like, what in the heck? Um, when my abuser was court-martialed the second time, I had to go to my commander and say, hey, sir, you know, I'm gonna have to go testify at this court-martial. I was really afraid because I didn't have that trust or that support from that first command team. So when I went to my second commander and I told him I had to go, he did something that was really just unprecedented for me. And he said, how can I support you? How can I help you? And, and I said to him, you know, I don't want you to lose faith or confidence in me because I have to go do this. And he said, your rape did not define you. It does not define you rather it makes you, you know, strong in it. And I'm so grateful for you, you know, being part of my team. And I think that um, he, he became one of the most trustworthy, you know, people in my life, in my journey for recovery, because he said to me during that moment, you matter, I hear you, and, and I'm going to support you. And I think that that's really, you know, the diff one of the biggest differences between the 2006 pre-focused, um, you know, because that's really 2006, 2007 is really when Congress said, no more, we're not going to tolerate this, you know, and started actually putting trainings together and, and really focusing on how do we become better at supporting victims of these crimes. And I think that, you know, today it's just, it's, I mean, look at, we're having a conversation about this so that we can, you know, teach other people. And so this is something that would never have happened in 2006. And so um, you're going to have to cut this next part out. I forgot the question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, the um, I, I appreciate you that you were you were sharing um, a, a part of that 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 experience, and what what I I kind of gleaned from that first portion of that was became very very difficult. You know, as you were coming forth, and and this this trauma has happened to you, this abuse has happened to you, and it's almost this sense that you don't get it, you don't get the feel that your chain of command is supporting or believing you, and, and if you could you know, describe that. And I know you talked about your second commander. How, how do you, how, do, how as, as a service member, as, as being told you're part of a team and the person that you should be able to go to, because we've, we hasn't changed. We've all had open door policies, you know, and we've all want to believe that, Hey, everybody has a squall leader, you know, a platoon sergeant, platoon leader and goes up there. But when you find yourself, you know, being a victim of abuse and you recognize that your chain of command you know, is, is not being supportive or doesn't feel like they're believing you through your actions and behaviors. I, I would ask, what would you offer to somebody that is brand new in command, whether a commander and first sergeant, and somebody receives this report? What kind of behaviors, what kind of response? And I know you gave an indication of your second commander of this. And then if you were a peer, you know, what would you offer to them? And then at the same time, if you're a victim going through this, what would you offer to, you know, who would you confide in the first portion to build that trust and vulnerability to try to go out and then get your chain of command to understand what you just went through? You know, I think that's, that's such a good question. And I think it's really hard to answer because every single situation is just really so different. But I think that, you know, it's, 
it's acknowledging and, and learning people, right? It's, it's wanting to know about them. It's recognizing that the duty day is not over at five o'clock, you know, paying attention to your soldiers. I think one of the, um, one of the hardest things that I had to go through when I was actually going through this was realizing that I was kind of being very reclusive, but not realizing it until it happened, right? I was isolating myself and not realizing that I was doing it. Um, and I think for me, like I said, my abuser was very good at his craft. You know, he had convinced really my entire command team, leadership team that he was phenomenal. Um, but not only that, like he had convinced my friends that I was really too much drama, right? He would say things to them like, are you flirting with her? Don't flirt with her. And, and so they, they would pull themselves away. Um, even with my family, my mom, like I said, was active duty army. She was stationed in Germany with me at the, at the time of my abuse. And, um, he would say things like, well, let's not hang out with your mom. Like, let's just you and me hang out. But, but very manipulative, right? He would want that so that I wasn't with my mom or my dad or, or have that support system. And so I think, um, you know, one of the examples I give to people is, um, I love the TV show Survivor. It's literally my favorite show on the planet. Um, I've applied like 17 times. As soon as I'm done taking off the uniform, I'm applying again. <laughs> um, but I made my sister come and stand in line with me for 12 hours when we were stationed. My first duty station was Walter Reed. I called my sister up and they were filming the season four finale in, in New York. And I said, oh my God, Natalie, we've got to go. And she said, I'm not going. That's so stupid. And I said, please. And she said, no. Um, New York is my favorite place on the planet. I've, I've lived, I've, I've traveled through all 50 states and I've been to like 46 countries, but um, Manhattan, New York's my favorite. So she said, no, I called my mom and I was like, mom, make her go with me. And so my mom did, guilted her into it, but we ended up going through, we drove through the Holland Tunnel to go. And there was like this weird, crazy thing in the pit of my stomach where I was like, I just got to figure out where we have to be. Let me just go see where the line is and then I'll take you and I'll show you the city and, you know, do all these things. And we got there and there was already a line waiting. And I told my sister, I said, I can't go with you. I have to stand in line. And I ended up waiting in line with my sister because she was very mad at me, but she did it for 12 hours to get to see the finale of Survivor. Um, and I say that because a few, three sh short years later, I was very reclusive and very, you know, not excited about doing a lot of things and not wanting to go out and, and really, you know, a homebody. And I think that that's one of the biggest changes my family recognized, right? Like, where is this kooky girl that was going to go and stand in line for, you know, 12 hours to go get a glimpse of your favorite player? Um, she was gone. And I think that when I would, when I talk to battle buddies, I say, if you have a friend that used to go and, you know, go to travel and go see sites and want to go and, you know, uh, try different foods. And now all of a sudden they're hanging out at the barracks or they don't want to go anywhere and they've pulled away. Maybe it's not a sexual assault. Maybe it's not, um, you know, maybe something didn't happen to them. That's super traumatic, but something might've happened to them. Right. And so kind of reach out and ask them like, Hey, what's going on? Is there anything I can do for you? You know, my best friend's mom passed away the other day and I called her and I said, I don't know what to say. So I'm just going to talk about my day. And, and I think that that was really hard for me because when people don't know what to say, they just kind of pull back. But then what they do is become more reclusive, right? You, they isolate you even more. And I think that that's really, really important is that if you have a battle buddy that is going through something and you don't know what they're going through, just be there for them. But if you have a battle buddy and you know they've been sexually assaulted, it's an uncomfortable conversation, but sometimes maybe the best thing you can do is just say, hey, I'm here for you. I don't know what to say to you, but I'm here for you. Um, I think with leadership teams, you know, I, I was able to successfully complete command. Um, it was a tough thing because I kind of always had this like fear, like, oh my gosh, what will I do if, you know, somebody comes forward with a sexual assault because I didn't want to mess it up for them. But I think, you know, my, my, I guess my, uh, recommendation for someone new to command is stay impartial. Don't make decisions, right? You're not the investigator. You're not the one that's trained to look at the evidence. And so if you have potentially the perpetrator, 
and or the victim may be together in the same unit, remain that unbiased party and don't don't decide that you know you know immediately what's going to happen. You know, all too often we get um, parts of the story, and then when we get the whole story, we're like, oh, you know, I think that the um, the EO office says it's best, right? There's three sides to every story this person's side, this person's side, and the truth is really some sort of combination of both of those. And so when you're in a leadership position, don't jump to conclusions because maybe it is correct, but maybe it isn't. And now you've, you've impacted that trust, right? You've impacted your ability to be um, trustworthy to whomever it is that you're, that you're working with. Um, I think, you know, I tell, I tell people all the time, maybe some doesn't come right out and say like I was raped maybe thing like I think I had sex last night I, I don't know and I think that you know it's really hard to open up about something so personal and tragic so when they say things like that you know kind of listen and I think that those are kind of the biggest you know red flags if you will that I would I would venture to give as guidance to folks from you know the battle buddy perspective the leader perspective um, and just really kind of the you know work perspective. I think the only piece of that I I um, think is a little bit different is the family perspective. And I say that you know my mom is the Sharp program manager for Netcom, um, very involved in the Sharp program. My sister is a psychiatrist, so she's working with you know folks over at Tripler. And I think that it's really important for folks to not close that door. You know, one of the hardest things for me when I was going through this was figuring out how do I tell my family without hurting their career or hurting where they are. But, you know, my sister, um, cause again, this was 15 years ago. So a long time ago, um, she would say things like, Oh, you're dumb. If you go back to him. Well, what she did was she closed the door for me to talk with her anymore. Right. I didn't want to open up to her because there was there was almost this like inability to leave. I was stuck in Germany. I couldn't PCS. Um, he would come to my house, and you know everyone else, all of my friends were essentially gone. He was he was the only person I kind of had to count on, um, but I, I couldn't get away from him. And so he made it so that he was my only option. And I think that when people say things like, "Oh, you know, you're," dumb for going back or whatever. It really is hard because you close that door to ever be their sounding board again. So I think from a family perspective, I, I'd say that words matter so stinking much and, you know, make sure that you use the right kinds of words. You know, people say, we watch a movie and there's somebody that's being abused and people just kind of like off the cuff say, oh, that, that person's stupid. Why did that person stay, right? Girl or guy, why did he stay? Why did she stay? But it's really hard to get out of the situation when you're in it. It's hard to pick up and say, I'm going to go, especially if you don't have, you know, the financial support or if you're financially dependent on the person that you're with, if there's children involved, if you're afraid, if they threaten you, it's not that simple. You know, I think I'm a very strong person, but you don't start dating someone on Monday and on Tuesday they start raping you. It's a very gradual process. It takes time. Um, abusive people, you know, they, they set the stage. They figure out how to get to the point where it's, you're not even realizing it's happening, right? You know, in my case, my abuser was awesome when we first started dating. You know, we used to go out and get dressed up and go dancing. And then he would you know, say, oops, something fell. <laughs> he would say, like, didn't you say you wanted to lose weight? Like, maybe you should have a salad tonight, right? Um, or he would say, gosh, you were so lucky I put up with you. You were so annoying. Nobody's ever going to want to be with you. And so those are things that you start to believe. You start to believe, like, well, I'm not worthy. I'm not enough. I'm, I am, you know, why can't I stop making him mad? Instead of, like, he shouldn't be mad at that. You know, I was like, why can't I be enough to make him happy? And so I was constantly trying to make him happy and, and do different things for myself that weren't normal, right? Wear different clothes or make different foods or whatever. And I think that 
that it then became for me, it became very emotional. Um, you know, he, or psychological, he would show me like his brass knuckles or his knife. And, you know, you didn't, I didn't realize I was living in fear. Like I better not say anything because he's got that, those brass knuckles, or I better not do anything. And you just don't realize it's happening until you realize it. Right. And so I think that's really the hardest thing for people from the outside to see is that you don't start dating someone and then they become abusive. It's a very long process. And so while it's really clear for somebody on the outside to be like, hey, that's an unhealthy relationship. When you're in it, you don't realize it. You know? And so when I was in it, I was like, why am I not enough? Why am I making him mad? Why is he so frustrated with me? Um, rather than he's being irrational and I don't care. You know, sorry. I went on off on a tangent. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's, that, that's, that's great. And I appreciate you sharing that. If if I could go back and and help for the team, you know what I what I I thought I heard you were saying. So number one, you know, when I asked that question about, you know, what would you offer to somebody who's a peer, you know, chain of command and kind of command team, the the first person or the first thing I took away from is you've got to be able to listen. So if you don't have that that competency skill set, if you're the person, you know that that already believes that you know what happened. If you already are surmising, if you only have, have only seen one eighth of the entire pie, then 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 you've already through your actions and behaviors have already sent a different message through your nonverbal communication. I think as we get older, I think as we get set in our ways, I think we'll be beyond the age of twenty nine, and we believe that we we understand the way the world works. We have heuristics. We have conditioning. And we start to believe certain things until, you know, this is the part about stretching yourself to be a critical thinker. And, and a lot of times it doesn't matter if we're talking about trauma or abuse or injustice. I think your job as a commander is to listen first and speak second. You know, and a lot of times I think it's the, one of the most, you know, valuable, you know, advice that you provided was if you don't know, be upfront. I don't know what to do, what to say at this moment. I need to take the time to reflect um, because it's important the moment that somebody is communicating to you. And, and I think it's important to know the rules as well. You know, if, if I'm having this conversation, you know, with a family member about abuse and trauma, that's a different role and a different listening skill set than if I'm listening to them as a peer versus as I'm listening to as a commander. And, and I think that you need to understand that as you're going through I think the second part about being a better listener or being a, a, a developing a skill set of being a better, better listener is you have to have increased self-awareness. So it's important to know, right? I, I'm, this is how old I am. This is why I grew up. This is what I believe. And these are my biases. And when somebody tells me something that I don't necessarily agree with, can I at least understand you know, from their perspective, their heuristics, why they would believe and then walk through this. So, so very simple, what you just highlighted, you know, when, when we look at a movie and we watch something and we go, why did that individual stay with that person, in that relationship, that's dumb, you know, or they're, they're making a poor decision. I've experienced that, you know, when I listen to stories, you know, with my wife and with my, with my daughter, you know, and, what I've, what I've realized is, is as I've continued to mature, my, my job is to listen and, 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 and not to judge. My, my job is to listen and understand and, and realize that the reason why they are the way they are now is they had to go through, as you mentioned earlier in this discussion, is through their own experience, through a support network, you know, through realizing that they do have value and self-worth and building that confidence to see things different in a different perspective. I think the, the second portion that I took away from this is when you talk about the importance about being a, a good listener and having that self-awareness is when you listen, you're still helping build that bridge of this network. And, and I always tell my son, right, surround yourself with positive people. You know, your network is your net worth. Establish a positive network and not surround yourself by energy vampires, joy thieves. And a joy thief could be somebody, as you mentioned, you know, Holly, just, hey, I don't want to talk about it. Or, hey, I don't know how to deal with it, so I don't want to ever engage with it. And then those individuals who believe that, hey, you were my closest friend, you were my commander, you are supposed to be the leader that's invested in me, and they're wondering why you're just not there. 
you know, and a, and a simple gesture is, you know, sitting down next to you and says, you know, I, I know that you're going through something, you know, and I'm just here to listen, you know, is something that I think that they would appreciate. And then I think the, the, the third portion about is this connection, you know, and we talk about in, in the, in the military. And one of the things that I love about being on this team and being part of this institution and this organization is every day when you get to surround yourself with soldiers and a team, I said, they all come from different walks of life. And every day you're getting an opportunity to learn something different about them. So I ask my soldiers and my leaders, you know, specifically the leaders, how do you know your soldier is having a good day or a bad day? You know, when I walk in, the first thing my wife can tell by the expression on my face is I'm having a good day or a bad day. I've told this story before in the in the in previous podcasts when I used to walk in when I was early, you know, in my in my marriage that I would, you know, go uh, turn on ESPN, go get a beer, you know, kick the dog and then ask my wife how her day was. And it wasn't until I realized later on that she was upset. She wasn't really voicing anything. She just didn't want to talk to me, you know, and she was getting a, a little quiet. And I said, did I do something wrong? And I didn't realize that just those actions in that order was really showing her that was the thing that I saw was important as I walked in the door. And so I've had to adjust and I've had to develop and I've had to grow. And, and, I, and I share with everybody that just in a personal relationship that you should be treating, you know, if you're in a relationship that you're planning to stay with somebody for your entire life is every day is date day. You know, you find the opportunity, right, to find something special. You find the opportunity to, you know, say something that's positive to let them know that you are the only person in their life. And I also say, don't go to bed angry, you know? So those two things are like kind of like the left and right limits, I think. And there's, and there's some, you know, freedom of movement in between all that. Um, but this connection, how, how do you know, you know, if your soldier is having a good or bad day and every day you should be finding out something else new about them that they would appreciate, you know, something about their family, something about what they want to do, something they're struggling with. Um, just to show that you have that that simple aspect of care. And then, you know, I, I thought it was interesting when you were, you were talking about it. A lot of times, you know, we all have done this. We have faulted. And, and, and part of this is, you know, as the bureaucracy side of, of the institution. You know, I, I share that, you know, the, the profession of arms is so large. We're kind of dual character in nature. There's the profession aspect of it where we want leadership you know, empowerment, all that aspect of it, building trust, but there's a bureaucratic side because we're just so large, right? So, you know, we just can't just assume that, hey, we're, this is how, you know, uh, this battalion uh, hands out pay, you know, this battalion, you know, hands out pay. We do everybody by, by this order. Everybody gets paid the exact same way at the same time just because they're so, it's, it's such a large organization. We have to have bureaucratic systems. But, you know, when we, when we think through this portion of it, you know, it, it really goes back to, you know, as, as we look at in this institution, the special aspect of is building this connection with our soldiers. But a lot of times we all fall to this production of results and what in our army ethic, there's really three C's, character, competence, and commitment. And a lot of times we value competence, you know, a lot higher because this individual, as you mentioned, and it's unfortunate, you know, when you mention and you talk about, you know, your abuser, Everybody thought very highly of him. I'm sure he was very competent, very good at his job, you know, uh, very skilled in the things that he needed to do to demonstrate proficiency and efficiency. And, and what I would share, I see a lot of soldiers, and what I would message to my leaders is it should mean something when you voice and you're speaking on behalf of somebody's character. So if, if somebody's turning around and, and comes to, and I had this experience where somebody came to voice um, at, at, a, at a, uh, a board of inquiry on behalf of an officer. And on this officer, I with the first question that I asked, and this officer was under, you know, a, a, a review for, for sexually harassing uh, females across his battalion. And, and he was suspended from his position, and he was working, you know, at, at a, in a different position away from that. And these two officers came to speak on his behalf, his character. And so initially, I... I I sat there and I asked the question, are you here as character or competence witnesses? And they both said, we're here as character witnesses. And I said, okay, I want you to just tell me something about what he does after 1600. 
I want you to tell me what does he look like in civilian clothes. I want to share with me what is his favorite drink. I want you to share with me when he has a piece of good news or bad news. Who is he going to call on his personal or his professional network? And so it became very uncomfortable in this questioning that I was asking. And so I said, would you be comfortable with this individual working with females? Yes, sir. I, I have sat with him. He said, works right next to me, this, that, whatever. And so when I was talking to one officer, I said, okay. I said, why would you be comfortable? Because if he stepped out of line, I would crush him. I said, okay. And so I said, one more question, because I could tell he was very upset that I was asking him. I was like questioning whether he knew the difference between character and competence. I said, I just have one more question. I said, do you have children? And he knew I knew he had children. He said, yes, sir, I do. I said, do you have a daughter? He knew I knew he had a daughter. He said, yes, sir. I said, how old is your daughter? And his daughter was of age of, you know, out of being in college, working. And I said, would you be comfortable knowing that your daughter was working for somebody that had these alleged offenses, especially if there was not somebody like you in between them as the supervisor to crush him if he stepped out of line. And it got very, very awkward. And then I had to ask the question, I'm sorry I didn't hear your response. And so I, at that moment, took an individual that was a character witness, realizing that he was not there to speak on character, but competence, didn't know the difference in that. And then when I asked the hard question, when it applied to them, then it took pause. And he, he answered the question, no, I would not be comfortable. Yeah, I think, um, I think that's really powerful because what people don't understand when we look at character is that especially abusive people, they highlight the things ab about character that they want you to see and they don't highlight the things they don't, right? So most of the time, those character qualities of you know being trustworthy and being reliable, those are things that abusive people are really good at because they don't want you to see the other pieces. And um, I think, yeah, that's really powerful. You, you know, you were talking about relationships and you know, one of the things that I, I had asked the question with our team here recently was, you know, I, I'm a believer and I voice, you know, in terms of my discussion with leaders that, you know, punishment's about the offense and not the individual. And a lot of times I, I think leaders don't really understand when, you know, there's an incident that occurs within a household how to handle this because one, they think it's a private event Two, if they're forced to deal with it because Hey, now the MPs or now the law enforcement is involved and it, it kind of defaults to family advocacy. Well, we were going to wait for family advocacy to determine, you know, what happens. And then we go back to this. And, and, and what I, what I have shared with them is I said, listen, you know, a lot of the things that we do, there are some great programs, you know, that within the military and the army to help, but why do we wait until after the event happens? So when you gave all those examples, you know, of what you were going through, even through the time of dating, what I asked, you know, our team was how many individuals or how many, how many challenge relationships do we have in your battalion? And, and the numbers they came back to was very, very, you know, eye-opening because initially they just looked into the fact of how many people were going to FAP, Right. Then they, then they looked around and said, how many people are considered high risk with the three, you know, top indicators of occupational stress, relationship or finance. And then the, the third thing was how many people are the chaplain seeing? And I said, okay, guys, let me, let me, let me open the aperture on this. What I'm talking about is when I talk about a challenge relationship, how many times have we seen an individual when they're talking to their significant other girlfriend, boyfriend, spouse and they're screaming on the phone at work in public and then as I'm talking about this Holly you can see there's a pause I said because that's the that's the, one of the things that I'm talking about we're not attuned to watch and look for those things until it gets to the point where okay now the MPs are involved now FAP has been called now law enforcement is involved now someone called about a domestic you know disturbance and, this, and the second part was, as I said, why do we wait for the education? Because just as you mentioned, this personal ability to build this connection, we should be helping our soldiers because, 
you know, it doesn't matter if you're 18 or 30, we're all continuing to develop these life skills to deal the things with later on that we have to help with in our own personal and professional lives. So when Chung ends up communicating that, hey, I met somebody online, why am I waiting to go to a class to learn about communication and conflict resolution? And then you find out that, you know, now Chung says that this individual is a girlfriend. What else are now we, we, we walking through, you know? And then same thing, now engaged and then married. And then now I'm having a child. Why are we waiting till we have challenges and being reactionary toward it when we know these things are occurring and they're going to be predictable things that are occur in our life? I was wondering if, we, if, if you could share your thoughts on some of the things that you offered that, that, that I commented on. I think, um, you know, it, it gets back to just exactly what you said, recognizing that, you know, I, when I was going through this abusive situation with my abuser, I can't tell you how many times he would call me names on the phone and I would get off the phone just in tears um, or, you know, just be a mess and just like, why am I not enough and, and say those things out loud. And I think that, you know, back in 2006, we didn't teach people or equip them with what they needed to really recognize those things. And really what I'm hoping now is that we are recognizing, we are being able to have those conversations. But I think, in my opinion, still, we, we have a long way to go. Um, you know, we have so many things that we can still do because exactly what you said, people feel like, oh, that's their home. I don't want to get involved. You know, just think about when you're at Target and somebody, you know, has got a screaming kid and you think like, oh my gosh, what a terror but you don't say anything, right? And, and I think that those are the parents where it's like, oh, you wanna say something because they spank them on the butt or whatever the case may be. And you're thinking like, gosh, I would have never hit my kid that hard or something like what an awful person that is. But we don't get involved because it's so, it's not our place. But I think that as leaders in the military, it absolutely is our place. We have to start recognizing and have those crucial conversations with people. Because if we don't have those crucial conversations with people, they will end up in that category of folks we said, right, where they're, we're reacting instead of being proactive. Um, one of my sergeant majors, he used to uh, he used to say to me all the time, like, "Ah, oh, you guys shouldn't date. You shouldn't date." And I didn't know it until after, right? And so I think it's one of those things where he was the only person that was ever vocal about, like, "You two are not good together," and he's he's not kind to you. And, you know, you don't um, flourish when you're with him. And he was the only person that ever said anything. But I think it's because we're, we have a fear of having those crucial conversations. I mean, it's, it's the same thing when you, you know, connect it to why do people laugh when you talk about about joke every kind of laughs because laughter is easier than you know combating the problem and I think for me um partly because of what I've been through but partly also because I just I don't really come to work to make friends I'll cut people off in a second and say do not speak about like do not speak like that around me but that's hard because then you become the not cool person and nobody wants to hang out with you and you know nobody wants to be around you because you always are the downer but you have to be willing to have those conversations with people or nobody will be better you know and and i think that i mean you hit the nail on the head sir just being able to recognize the preemptive stuff so you can forego the post stuff is is really important you know, you know, one of the things that, that we're trying to do now, you know, we, it's, as I say, you know, techniques and stuff and how people meet um, and they, we don't recognize the things that are going on as they start forming these relationships and whether there's unhealthy behaviors and stuff in there until, you know, something is brought to our attention because of an incident. And so what, what I've, I've uh, turned around and a lot of these things when we're talking about, you know, sexual assault and sexual harassment, you know, it's come down to this discussion about consent. And so one of the things that, that we, we have done here is that, you know, when we go through this, we have to go through this education piece that we're going to then communicate to everybody that says, here is what consent is defined as when you wear this uniform. It doesn't matter if what state you're on or if you're from the planet Mars, right? And it doesn't matter if it's, you know, uh, um, somebody that you've met or dating online. It doesn't matter if you're engaged or not. It doesn't matter if you're, you're married. You know, this is what consent is defined as. There's no 
stipulation or disclaimers because you're in a different type of relationship. And the other thing is, here's all these unhealthy behaviors, you know, that are associated with it, that places people that considered as sexual harassment and sexual assault. And so what we've done is the approach is we're going to take away the response of, of what I have learned from talking with Tim Kite and Coach Urban Meyer of, you know, living below the line, blame, complain, and defend. We're going to take away the response that said, I did not know. So now when a soldier comes in and, you know, goes through and, and reads all this stuff and goes, okay, I understand what consent is and signs that. And then I get a, a phone call that says, hey, this was the case, blah, 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 blah. And I said, really? Here's, here's exactly what you said you knew and understood as you're going through this. I'm not waiting for the month of April to discuss what consent is. I'm not waiting until an incident occurs to have this conversation. It's the same approach that we've done with, you know, POWs, you know, with privately owned weapons. It, it doesn't matter if you own one or not. I'm going to make sure that every soldier receives the same standard counseling and signs it that says, this is how you transport. This is how you carry it. This is how you safely bring it on and off the installation because we care about you. And I don't want you to be titled later on because you're bringing an un unregistered weapon, you know, onto the installation. And the, and the argument is you cannot say I did not know. And so that's the first part, right? So now we're really talking about education. We're talking about how do we help create this environment where, you know, if you've talked to uh, Kim Scott, the author of Radical Candor and now Just Work, and she works with Trier Bryant, and they have a great framework. And they, and they really talk about injustice in the workplace, and they talk about it in the terms of bias, uh, prejudice, and bullying it. Bias, not meaning it, prejudice, meaning it, and bullying just being mean. And they give you strategies on how to deal with it. So she also talks about the four roles. And what we're really kind of talking about is how do you intervene? And that's part of the challenge a lot of times that we're not talking about. So one, it's being, I think, as a, as a leader, you've got to be acknowledged that you have you know, these challenges that you're constantly having to make sure that your force is educated and certified, you know, to have these conversations about it and know that as a leader, primarily your, your, your number one job is to listen. The, the second thing is you have to be able to explain there's going to be two people in this situation, those that harmed and those that were harmed, but there's a third individual that helps brings clarity to this, which goes back to, as you mentioned, in your own personal journey, while you felt like you were alone in some instances, there's the upstander. And the upstander is the individual that should be looking at it. And I, and I would reference back to the example of saying, I've got to be an upstander in my personal, and I've got to be an upstander in my professional life. And it doesn't turn off at, at 1600 or 1700 You know, and it's, uh, it, 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 a lot of times it goes back to when you see something, that you feel, you'll know, and I truly believe, you know, those that have chosen and to volunteer and wear this uniform, they know. Something inspired them, you know, that somebody, you know, there's, there's goodness and there's greatness, you know, in every one of them, that they know what right is. And when they see it and they sense it, they know it deep down inside in their gut, but they don't say anything. And that's what I'm trying, trying to make sure that how do you create this environment to get after that. And so based on your experience and now walking out of 20 years, what would you offer to our team that says, how do you create this? How do you help those that are, you know, it's one thing to be a colonel in the army. It's another thing to be a brand new private and try to be an upstander, which is very, very difficult. I think it, I, one of the, probably the easiest answer to this is doing it right. Set that, set that example. I think that Far too often in the military, we end up having experiences where we hear people say things, but we don't see them do that. You know, we, we, we hear what they want us to do, but then that's not the example that they've set. And I think that, um, you know, one of the hardest things about me kind of sharing my story with people is there are a lot of people that are like, I could never, not as a field grade officer, but I think that that's one of the hardest, you know, things that we struggle with at, at the senior level is we go to training, we see that the training um, vignette, if you will, is uh, privates at the barracks or at a bar, spiked drink, and that's the vignette. 
And statistically, that's not the case. Statistically, the person that's going to be sexually assaulted is in a relationship with somebody and they're, you know, connected to them in some way, shape or form. So being able to be a field grade officer and share my story of survival with folks is really important because what it does, I hope, is let people know that it isn't just the privates that this happens to. It is the more senior folks and it's okay to be open about behavioral health, about struggles, about challenges that you have, because when you when you're honest and open about them, it creates that trust and it gets people, you know, to the point where they're willing to kind of share or or experiment or go down that road. And I think that, you know, in my experience, I would say that when you hear people say something, but you see them do something else, you don't have it. But when you hear people say something and you see them do it, they will follow suit. And I think that, um, you know, if I had to pick one thing I would say um, as I'm leaving the army, it's be the example. Don't say the example, but be the example because, you know, um, it's hard. It's hard to come forward and talk about some of the things that, you know, specifically that I've been through, but I want other people to know. Um, like I think I shared earlier, every single time I've presented, and I've, I mean, I've given multiple presentations over the last couple of years. Um, I went to Congress and presented before Congress in 2014 to a special congressional panel. And after that is kind of when I started really kind of sharing my story publicly. But, you know, I've probably briefed over 50,000 people throughout my time presenting. And I think every single time there's somebody in the audience that's more senior that comes to me and says, I can't believe that you had that courage. Thank you. It happened to me too, but I haven't said anything. And it's because they don't want to lose, you know, the kind of the position that they have or the, the, the power that they have, because they don't want to let people see that they're also, you know, it's a potential that they could be hurt. It's a potential that they could have some of this happen to them and that they may have to go to behavioral health. But, but I think it's really important to just be the example. I, I think that's great, a great point. You know, when, I, when I'm talking about, you know, leadership philosophy, I talk about judgment. I talk about purpose. I talk about the environment. I talk about communication and being three parts, center, receiver, feedback. And then I talk about trust. And when, you know, you can define trust in, in, in multiple different ways. And somebody will talk about, hey, in the, uh, our Army ethic really is, hey, character, competence, commitment, those three things together is what defines trust. But I think that, you know, what I offer when I, and I appreciate you're echoing the same thing after 20 years of experience is that one of the, one of the fastest ways to build trust is to lead by example. So does the audio match the visual? So for a very, you know, easy thing is if you say that family is important, you know, and you may walk in your office and they don't see any pictures of your family. You never talk about, you know, your kids or your spouse. They never hear you talk about the things that you're planning for them, you know, and, and I use this in my own personal example. You know, it's funny because you've got that, that banner up there, which makes my PAO very happy, you know. In this, in this great, you know, Pacific Northwest that gives us an opportunity, anytime you get a stretch of sunshine, you know, we forget that it actually rains a few times here because we're living in like a, the set of the Twilight movies. And so we were actually planning because my son's 17 years old and he's getting to the point where he's starting to look at different colleges. And we were planning on taking him up to the UW campus and kind of walk around and show those things. But at the same time, you know, he's got a pretty serious girlfriend we also talked about during that same portion of it, my wife and I, we already had a date night planned out. And it's important for us to model to him what, you know, taking, taking his girlfriend out and showing the importance of, of dating and not just getting comfortable. And so, you know, I, I say these things to him just about how he should be, how he should act. But if he never sees this, he just sees this as my mom and dad, no affection, not planning, not taking the time for those things, then it's very difficult, right? Because the audio doesn't match the visual. And it's that goes back to that leadership by example. So I think that's great advice, you know, as, uh, as you've highlighted. You know, when we talk the environment piece of this, you know, and, and, and we've seen the education, how do you build the reps to make sure those 
you know, there's one aspect of understanding the, the policy and the regulations of all those things. But the one thing that I really like is when you said just do it, and I think that I took away is when, when a great piece of advice a senior leader gave me is in, in difficult situations, then you should be with your soldiers. I think that is very, you know, similar to what you said is even if you have no idea what to say, be right next to them, right? And then if the situation is risky or difficult, a lot of times having these conversations about things that we're talking about here is very, very difficult, then you should lead it. And so, you know, I commend you as, you know, a a field grade officer, as a senior leader that's able to stand up there and be open and transparent because that's the beginning of, you know, what Dan Coyle and, and others have talked about, this vulnerability loop. And in another ways to build trust is to be this open and transparent, establish this open vulnerability and this vulnerability loop that starts to show this thing we call shared risk. And you can tell from your feedback that you've gotten, people that have heard your presentations have come up, 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 appreciated, applauded your efforts, and then now have come back to you. And they have now had some type of connection to share that same thing. But for those, when you talk about how difficult is it, you know, to go through this? Because we've all gone through, nobody wants to. It's just genetically, you know, I think wired and, and disposed that we don't want to share failures. And when something is so personal, what gives you the courage? Can you offer to somebody that has gone through something or knows somebody that's going through them? How do they, how do they get to the point of just starting you know, to get to the point of recognizing their own self-worth and the building the confidence to get them to tell their own story? Um, I have a couple of different things to say. First and foremost, uh, go Huskies, right? I graduated from 2017 as my alma mater, so go Huskies. Um, the second thing, I think it's, it's very hard to ever admit your failures. And I think that Um, I have a very good friend who we were talking uh, relatively recently, but she gave me one of the biggest breakthroughs I've ever had in my entire adult life. And that is that I had children when I was emotionally unhealthy in an emotionally unhealthy situation, but then expect them now to be emotionally healthy. And I think that that goes to, you know, what you just explained. And that is that I did not set a good example for them because I was very emotionally unhealthy, very, you know, I was traumatized and trying to recover from these really awful things that had happened to me. I did not teach my kids to kind of communicate well because I didn't know how to do it myself. But now, you know, 14 years later, when I'm capable of sharing my story and being emotionally unhealthy, I look at my kids and I'm like, why aren't you emotionally healthy, right? Because I haven't set that stage. And so I think that's really important to say that we have to be willing to, to look at ourselves and accept kind of the failures that we've had. Um, that was a really hard pill for me to swallow was realizing like, it's my fault. My kids are not at an emotionally healthy stage, but I think recognizing that has given me at least the tools and the ability to fix it and help them fix it and help them navigate to be better you know, adults. I think to actually answer your question, um, I think it's it's really hard to share your story. It's hard to open up. You know, I kind of um, compare it and have compared it before to going to a restaurant, right? You go to a restaurant, you order a meal, it comes out exactly as you expect it, you leave and nothing is, no harm, no foul. Versus you go to a restaurant and you order pasta and chicken comes out and you're like, oh my gosh, this is the worst place ever. These people have horrible customer service. You know, then you go home and you get on Yelp and you're like, I hated that restaurant and you Facebook message them and tell them everybody was awful. I think that the people then that are heard or the people that actually kind of get their voice out are those ones that didn't have a great experience. And while you can never have a good experience going through a sexual assault or a sexual trauma or any kind of abuse, it's important for people to hear that the process works. Um, You know, I think earlier I shared with you. I'm the only person that's been through this process twice, both before and after the military decided to kind of put emphasis on it. But I'm also the only person that's had a guilty, um, a not guilty verdict and a guilty verdict. I'm the only person that's gone 
through it as an enlisted soldier and then later as an officer. I'm the only person that's gone through it with an SVC and without one. And so I think it's really important when you kind of look at all of those um, you know, facets of, of what I've been through to share and see how far the SHARP program has come and how far leadership has come and how far training and emphasis has come over the last 15 years. And I think it's, it's hard, but it's so necessary, especially from those senior folks, because we expect that, you know, the junior soldiers are going to kind of chat with one another because that's the example that we set, right? The example that we have in the training is that it's always a junior soldier in the barracks or at the bar or whatever the case may be. We don't expect that it's somebody you're dating or someone you're in a relationship with or someone. So when you have an opportunity to share with folks and you really are, you know, you look more like the example, or I mean, you look more like the reality than the example, it's very important. And so I think my advice to be, would be to someone that's, that's considering kind of opening up or sharing their story that the, the stories and the actual like connection to a person is what makes us better. It's not reading about it online. It's not, you know, watching a vignette and seeing, you know, kind of robotic, unrealistic situations take place, but it's hearing from somebody, yeah, I've been through it. And this is what I had to go through. And this is the emotion I had. And this is the rawness that it was, um, you know, a court martial is not easy. Um, again, I've been through two. So the first one, I had a sergeant major sat me down and said, listen, he's not going to be found guilty for what he did to you. So you need to prepare yourself. You know, and, and in a subsequent conversation, she said to me, if you would just listen, he would stop hitting you. And, and I was baffled, like, what? Are you kidding me? Versus, you know, now that would never, ever be something that somebody I would hope would not say, right? But I think that where we've come in this process is being able to stand up for ourselves, but share these experiences to show people it's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to have had really crappy things happen because like, I think by definition, we've all had something happen to us, right? Everybody's lost a dog or a cat or a kid or a brother or an uncle. You know, we've all had some sort of trauma. Um, whatever that trauma is and how it impacts us is just so significantly different. You know, unfortunately for me, my trauma is sexual assault. Um, but it's a, it's a connectable trauma that people need to hear about and need to hear that it's, it's okay. It, because I do, I go to behavioral health all the time. I just started therapy again recently when I realized that my daughter needed me to be a different kind of mom. And I said, well, crud. I'm back, you know, back to the work, back to the grind, because I have to be able to recognize what I need to do to better myself, not only as a parent, but as a person, you know, to be able to be there for other people. I cannot be a leader if I'm not willing to acknowledge that I have to continuously make myself better. You know, you, you, the learning process is never over, ever. You've got to always be willing to, to acknowledge that you're not the smartest person in the room, because the minute you, you say, I'm done learning is the minute you are no longer going to be effective in my opinion. No, I, I think that's, I think that's a very important insight. You know, one of the things I really appreciate you highlighting and from your experiences that you've talked about both enlisted officer of the two court marshals is really how far we've come along in the process and you know, what is available for our soldiers that may not understand, you know, those that are coming in and are thinking about joining the military, but have still heard stories from, you know, early times of 06, you know, 08 timeframe um, till now and, and understanding. And I appreciate that, you know, you, your willingness to share about how far along we've come around and to have some faith and trust in the process and the education and the outlook and the stuff that our leaders have gone through to make this organization a learning organization to get better. Um, the other thing that, that I, I hear and what I would offer to the team at the same time, when we all have trauma, there's different ways that we're going to go through this. And, and I, I think that one of the things that, have, that I personally found for myself is, is, is how do you reflect on this? And I find myself earlier on in my life not wanting to do any type of writing or reading. But as I get older, I continue to pour myself into things, you know, those that are looking at very similar problem sets, you know, those that are talking about certain things and listening and learning and, and trying to continue to develop. 
But the, the, the most amount of personal growth I think I have is through my own reflection. You know, it goes back to, I, do I still really believe these things? Have my, have my ideas changed? And this goes back to the importance of journaling. And so w- what I have found, you know, in, in different types of situations, you know, whether it's dealing with combat or diff- dealing with difficult relationships, you know, when you go through certain things, uh, when you write some things down about how you felt in that moment, you know, what you're struggling with in this portion of it, um, what, what I have found and what I have, I, when I have talked to others that are kind of finding out how do I go through building this confidence, being able to put paper to pen or a pen or paper, pen or pencil to paper, you know, and then writing some of these things down and then going back and reading it later on, you're almost seeing it as a different person, you know, or from a different perspective of the same person that helps you continue to work through this confidence of later on then being able to speak about it. You know, and uh, I remember somebody was telling me once it took them a while because they started to have to write things down. And then from the writing it down, they literally had to pick that up and read it aloud. And it almost took multiple reps of writing things down, you know, reflecting, writing it down, reading it aloud several times. And the first time reading it aloud, I mean, this individual broke down, you know, reading it aloud. And then gets to the point that after you hear it several times, then you're able to tell the story, you know. And I, I, I know that just as you mentioned, those that have gone through anything or going through something that's very difficult, that is a technique that I would offer that I, I think that's helps, especially for those, as you have mentioned, a lot of times some of our training does focus on a younger generation because there is a gap. You know, we know that they're coming in at 18 years old. They, there's there's different life experiences that we've had from those that are most senior. And so sometimes we do put a little bit more attention, you know, toward that generation to make sure we can close, you know, their 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 values and experiences, what, what we're asking of the values of this organization. So we can't forget to keep looking at those that are senior leaders that are going through other things in their life. And how do we maintain the pulse on those individuals as well? Sir, I could not agree with you more. I think when I started journaling myself, I didn't know what I was doing, right? You, it's not just pick up a pen and, and start writing um, and it doesn't come easy. It's kind of awkward and it's clunky and wonky, but you know, I would actually recommend if somebody is considering journaling to get a guided journal. Get, I mean, it, we have you know, lots of different kind of techniques where it guides you through that process because especially in the situation when there's trauma that's really intimate and you don't want to have to you know share it with anyone else it's personal and it's private and um actually what i did for a couple of years when i started journaling um for two reasons one i was trying to uh learn how to build fire for my uh survivor experience um but two is i would journal and then i would burn it and so it's a fire and watch it burn. Um, and I thought it was so dorky the first time I had thought of it. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is going to be such a silly thing. But it was so freeing. And so I ended up, you know, the first few times I journaled, I did not read them out loud. I wasn't strong enough to do that. But I was able to write it and I burnt it. And I wrote it and I burnt it. And I think, um, you know, one of the things we did with my children they were having um, some struggles, just really wanted to chat with their father. And because he is at Leavenworth right now serving his time, we we wrote him letters about anger. Why are you angry? You know, and I I had both the girls kind of write down things that made them angry. And we went out to our fire pit and we put them in the fire and they got to burn. And all of us did it. I think, again, right, getting back to the point where you got to set that example. We all did it. And I, I wrote it and, you know, I, I didn't realize the impact it had, but my daughter was like scribbling and she was like, you know, punctuating her periods because she was just really angry. And it was very freeing for her. She put that in the fire. She cried. I cried, you know, um, because it's very, very important. And I think the, one of the things I'd offer, because you, not everybody's medical, but you know, I am. So I, my examples are oftentimes medical, but we see a soldier that breaks a leg, right? This trauma is oftentimes personal. And, and sometimes it's physical, but sometimes, most of the time, right, when we talk about trauma in this sense, it's, it's emotional. So when a soldier breaks a leg and they've got that cast on, they've got it on for a couple, you know, weeks, months, whatever, six to eight weeks, everybody sees it, everybody knows the leg is broken, everybody's 
okay with it get the leg off and and you know we go run. and it's like oh my my leg really hurts well, everybody remembers that that leg was broken they remember that they had that cast and they're like it's okay you're doing great but we don't have that same kind of reminder you know for any kind of um ptsd related trauma and so for me i share with people really kind of just out of a need to remind them because we don't see it and it's it's an it's something that when we don't see it we we forget and i think that that's super important to kind of just remind people about is because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there you know there's a lot of people um who aren't connected personally or have a personal connection to sexual assault and so they think well that assault happened on friday it's monday get over it right you should be fine now it's all over and done with but what you don't realize is that it's such a long process. You know, my assaults were 15 years ago, but I'm still recovering. I'm still figuring out how to kind of manage because every single day presents a new problem. Like I said, you know, earlier, 15 years ago, my problems were, oh my gosh, I have two kids in diapers and I'm tired and I'm exhausted versus now I have two teenage daughters who really want to have a relationship with their dad who's in prison, who they can't communicate with and they're struggling with that, you know? And so every single kind of chapter or phase in your life presents a different opportunity for you. And so I think that it's really important to remember that trauma isn't always visible, but it's definitely always there. I think that's, I think that's great insight and great advice. Um, and I appreciate the recommendation for those that's going through something, those that know somebody that's going through something. I think that, you know, the journaling, we've, we've mentioned this several times with, with different podcast guests as, as a huge technique in reflection, personal growth, uh, a very private moment. I, I like the burning of it. It helps kind of build some closure. It's a, it's a different way to, to build that confidence and gain those reps of things. Um, so I, I think that's also something that, uh, that, you know, I think some, a lot of our team can take away from, you know, and, and as we kind of close this discussion, and I appreciate all the, the, the things that we've, we've gone back and forth about and, and then using your own personal experience to kind of shape some of these things, what, what, what I would ask is, you know, as you were going through this, and even now, as you continue to, to, uh, to work through with, with organizations, you know, like uh, Difference Makers 10 Strong, that's dealing specifically with trauma, what resources are available, you know, outside of the military you know, that, that those that are still going through, as you mentioned, you know, this long journey toward increasing resilience and growth um, that you could offer to the team? You know, that is such a fan stinking tastic question because every single city has just so many different resources. And, and I think, you know, depending on where you are, um, you know, the DOD safe hotline is out there forever or for everybody to use. But wherever you are, there are local services that are available. And I think it's really important, you know, for some installations do a fantastic job of kind of sharing and getting those resources out. Um, JBLM, I know, is one of them just because I was stationed uh, in Seattle for a little bit. But it's, it's really important for, I think, the team, wherever they are, to look and see what's available and share that. Because, you know, it's... The first time I ever went into a bathroom and I saw that number, if you're in, if you're, um, if you're being trafficked, call this, I thought, well, that's weird until I realized like how amazing it was. Right. And we have so many different opportunities and billboards and whatnot to, to put all that information in. But because, um, being, being a speaker, um, and talking about surviving sexual assault, I just learned about a resource in San Antonio two weeks ago that I was like, holy moly, I didn't even know this existed. But there are so many different resources. And because we have people that will stay in a situation because they don't know how to get out of it, I think, you know, I would, I would actually challenge your Sarks and, and victim advocates to figure out what the resources are local and start making sure that those are published. Because um, to answer and say, oh, this resource is available for everyone, it's hard because every city is different, every state is different. Um, but, you know, I think from a, from a, at least Washington perspective, you guys have a bunch of stuff up there. King County Sexual Assault um, Group is a fantastic uh, organization up there to use as well. Um, they have 
just a phenomenal amount of resources, grants, and whatnot. Um, there's there's just too many too many to list. Um, but I think if you're ever in crisis, the DoD Safe Hotline is one of the easiest, fastest ways to get directed to a place that can help you get some support. No, that's that's great. You know, our our Sark right now, Sergeant First Class McMahon, he's he's great on this. And I would agree with the same thing. What I've found, you know, being in different installations, there are a lot of great resources that a lot of times putting the right individual in these positions will help build this network. And then they're and they're gathering these things, you know, and, and increasing the 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 opportunity to connect these things with soldiers. Because as you mentioned, you know, there's different types of trauma. There's different situations, and every situation has something unique. So when you pick the right individual that's involved, you know, in, in the SHARP program, I think that is a, is a great way for them to go out and kind of cast the net and find out, build those relationships, network resources, because then you're helping leverage not just for, you know, soldiers, but also for their families as well as they're going through that. Yeah, I agree. I think that that's, you know, um, I have been presenting um, for the NOVA uh, group regionally. I've done it twice. And there's so many civilians that are in these communities that are right next to us, right? The civilian organizations are right next to the military organizations, but because we're separate, nobody knows really how to connect. And so NOVA has just recently started having training for um, civilian organizations to teach about military connected trauma so that they know what those resources are. And so, yeah, I think it's, it's fantastic. And I, I heard that your SARC is like pretty awesome. <laughs> So you guys are in great hands. Um, and so, you know, I challenge anyone else listening to, to step it up and, and figure out what resources are available, not only for you, but like you said, for the family, but then, you know, you get to share training opportunities. They get to teach you, you get to teach them. And, and you just, again, once you close that door to education, you've, you've lost. So just keep learning. Yeah. I think that, you know, one Sergeant McMahon is, uh, he's, he's okay. He's got a, he's got some things we got to, you know, smooth on his edges, you know, but he's, uh, I'll brag on, on him a little bit from the, from the program where it was before he got here and what he's, you know, he's come into, he understands the intent, you know, the things that he's done, what we kind of, we call it the environment team where he's worked, you know, with, uh, uh, FAP, SUDC, you know, behavior health, and we've actually created, you know, uh, a, a, a platform and really a, a functional location called the Lancer Performance Center and brought in our whole, uh, health and holistic uh, fitness team. So everybody's together. So if there's something that comes to his lane that he's got to work with uh, family av advocacy, it's right there. I mean, literally right next door. If there's something that goes into another realm, he's got a rep from BH. If there's something that has to deal with SUDC, so every one of these, I call them like they're like these secret Avengers that have these superpowers that nobody really knows and, until you bring them all together. And they really help with a holistic approach about helping resolve a lot of challenges that our soldiers are dealing with or their families. But I, I also thought, you know, as, 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 we were, as you were discussing this, and I know Sergeant McMahon has done a lot of this on his own to network resources just within the local you know, area, when I think about soldiers transitioning, you know, even like yourself, Holly, as going in, you know, into the civilian world, it would be nice to know, you know, as, as your journey continues toward resilience and recovery, that, and you may not have the access to things within DOD, that you can transition and you know all the things that are available within that. And that's something that helps our veterans as they make that transition and continue to help build this relationship and, and understand why we considered or we are considered as one of the most trusted professions, you know, in the country. Yep. Well, Holly, I, I really appreciate you taking the time and sitting down. It's, it was a great conversation, incredible insight. Thank you for your personal courage of sharing uh, your, your own experiences and the journey you've gone through. Congratulations to a successful career. You got one more week, you know, <laughs> And, uh, you know, we're, we're excited that you, you've made it through that. Thank you to, uh, for your service and, and for your family service, you know, and what you're doing and what you're doing for everybody that will end up listening to what you've offered and shared with us today. And, I, and I'd like to leave the final word with you. Well, sir, I will say that I am just so grateful to leaders like you that are doing things like this to be able to figure out how to connect to those 
soldiers that you know, don't do things the way we did them 20 years ago. Um, if I was staying in the army, holy moly, would I want to come work for you? I'm, I'm honored and just so excited to be here. Um, and I think my final word will just be, you know, I'll see you on Survivor. <laughs> That's great.